So I'm going to be talking about refractory RA, difficult RA. This is a, um, uh, a tough subject, but I want to start by doing some polling questions so we get in the habit of polling. Um, so you have on your app, um, a polling question will have come up. So I want you to ask this, answer this question. How often do you read drug product labels, the package inserts? One, always. Two, never. Three, sometimes. Four, only for toxicity. Five, mainly for dosing. Answer now. Again, if you're in the um, online, please answer. If you're in the room, please answer. I'm going to have three polling questions right at the start. This is just the warm up here. Okay. Slow start. All right. Let's just go and look at this right now with a few, few people reading and um, sometimes read. That seems fair. You know who reads the package inserts all the time and knows them front and back? The drug reps. They know way more about the product that you prescribe than you do. All right, um, so that, those are the results. We'll show it to you in two different ways. Actually, this is the results when I asked this in 2009 of almost 450 uh, uh, rheumatologists. And uh, the, the answer was they partially read it, sometimes read it. So pretty much you're in line with what your peers have said in the past. All right, and one more thing about this meeting. We really want to reward engagement and interaction. We think that that's where education is both for people who are here and also for people who are at home. So we've turned this into a, a tool, and it's called gamification, where everything you do, chatting, uh, answering polling questions, asking questions, going to booths, there's a lot of different ways to actually get points. And at the end, we're going to reward the people who are most involved, most engaged, and probably learn the most from this meeting. So you'll be seeing more of that. All right, so here's my talk, Making Treatment Decisions in Refractory RA. Um, these are my disclosures. I have been a consultant to a few companies about whose products I may be talking about here. I probably will mention some off-label use because when things get rough, you go off-label, and, sometimes, and, that, and that's, sometimes that's okay. So first polling question, are you online or are you on site? Please, I need everyone to answer this because all subsequent polling questions we're going to show maybe what the online audience thinks and what the in-house audience thinks. So please answer this now. Again, you can do this on your phone. You can do this on your laptop. Okay. Very good. So, and we do from registration expect people to have, to have more people on in the room. Maybe, and in fact, maybe two and a half times more people online. So that's good. All right, this is a good start. Let's stop there and let's go on to our next question. This one, I really need you to think. I need you to give me a word that defines difficult RA. Give me a word that go, defines refractory RA. There's another polling question. So again, you, you see these patients all the time. What's the one word that defines them? Maddening or, you know, no pay or um, late to clinic, whatever. But give me a, a word or two that you think defines these people. All right, we saw some flash of activity. This is a, a tryout on using a wordle as a way of representing your your impressions. All right, let me stop it and see where this goes. All right. Next. We'll just get out of this. So we saw frustrating. Uh, we saw a number of different um, words that you use. I want to point to you, point out to you that last year at this meeting, we had my book on, on stage giving us an address on difficult RA. Um, and her address would be sort of the other bookend to my address. 
She really looked at the evidence. She looked at what the, the published papers are, what the approaches are, what the thinking should be. It was really a wonderful presentation, and, and the Q&A was very rich with her because a lot of great questions came from that. In her presentation, she showed you what ULAR is doing in this area. ULAR is probably leading the way in defining and tackling the topic of difficult RA. She asked you to be clear about whether you're dealing with inflammatory patients, meaning they have signs of inflammation, or the non-inflammatory patients um, that have difficult refractory RA, because obviously the treatment algorithm changes. But in the end, we don't have a lot of data on what to do with these people. And what I'm hoping to do is to sort of outline an approach. So here's the ULAR definition of difficult to treat RA, also I would call it D2TRA. Uh, and you should have all three of these, failure of two or more biologics or targeted synthetics after you use a conventional um, um, DMART, okay? And then hopefully you're using more than one MOA on your quest to that. So these people will have failed methotrexate, probably failed a TNF inhibitor, and probably failed something else. They need to have signs of active or progressive disease defined as one or more of the following, moderate disease activity, signs of active disease, whatever you think that is, inability to taper steroids, rapid radiographic progression, or RA signs and symptoms even in the face of well-controlled disease. Boy, that's a black box right there. You think it's well-controlled, but they still have a lot of symptoms. That's a tough group. The last one is RA management is perceived as being problematic by both the physician and the patient. That's the ULAR definition. And with this definition, they're now going to do better epidemiology. They're now going to look at therapeutic approaches. They're now going to maybe develop constructs that will help you. But until this is done, the literature is scant on what to do with folks like this. And that is aside from the fact that all the drugs we use have been developed in people who failed methotrexate in people who failed TNF inhibitors. So in a sense, we treat you know, with patients who are somewhat refractory, but we, can we look to ULAR guidelines? Well, it's really not addressed in ULAR guidelines. If you look at the bottom of the ULAR guidelines, you know, they say what to do if you failed you know, either a biologic or a targeted synthetic. They say use the other one. Now, that's not necessarily meeting the definition of D2, uh, uh, D2TRA, right? So really, it's not addressed by either ULAR guidelines or by ACR guidelines, which has the same thing. They say, should you have maximal doses? Of course, if you're not on maximal doses, then use a biologic. Again, it's what you already do. You're, they're not teaching you or offering to you any options that's not already in your arsenal. How common is this problem? Well, if you look at it, and I'm showing you just four, but I, I could look at probably about 20 papers, and this number of 10%, keeps cropping up. I find this, one, really encouraging, meaning that you can pretty much manage 90% of patients, not all of them in remission, but with some degree of success or some degree of partial failure, if you will, but you can manage that. The difficult ones, or very refractory ones, it's 10% in Japan. Two different studies from Japan, Kyoto and, and Kyo. Uh, in Brazil, and even in Leeds. And, you know, there's a profile here. There's a lot of, you know, multi-drug resistance, but then there's a fair amount of comorbidity. There's other reasons that are often in play. You know, the uh, Kyoto study, they said that, you know, their patients seem to be unified by having high seropositivity, high DAS scores, and the presence of chronic pulmonary disease. But this number of 10% keeps coming up, and that's really encouraging. But if you're one of the 10%, you're managing the 10%, it's really quite maddening. So Wednesday, you're going to go to clinic. And, you know, it's a good day. You're seeing patients. Everybody's happy. It's 90%, 90%, 90%. It's 11 o'clock. You're thinking, i got to go at noon. i got to go to the jeweler to take care of my, get something from my wife because, you know, uh, happy wife, happy life. And, you know, so i got to get going. And i got two, uh, one more patient i got to get through. And, uh-oh, that's right, the unhappy patient shows up. Your day just went down the toilet. She's unhappy. Oh, you know what? She's the wife of the chief of surgery. And you told her, because 
the chief of surgery said, you're the best. Yeah, I'm the RA master. This is no problem for me. I'm going to have you dancing in three months, maybe sooner. And you're now on your fourth drug. And this patient is not happy. She's showing you her hands. You go, well, your hands look pretty good to me. But she's unhappy about something. But maybe she shows you hands that look like this. And now you're the one who's worried. Now you're the one whose hair standing on the back of your neck. And you're thinking, what am I going to do here? What, and, and so what do you do? What is your algorithm? What's your approach to these people? Uh, and you need an approach. I think most of us end up looking at the leftover list. What, the drugs I haven't used, what could I use? And it's a total flip of the coin. But you've been flipping the coin in your first three or four chances that fail. What do you think is going to happen the next one? It's going to fail too. And, and your success rate is going to go down, down, down. And so, yes, you could use maybe one of the drugs that you haven't used. What drugs are available to me? Well, I've got a lot of drugs. I've got more than 20 drugs that are, are, that, are, that are FDA approved for RA that I could use. Maybe I need to do something, instead of choosing a drug, better evaluate the patient. Should I do ultrasound? Should I do MR? Should I do psychometric testing? I, uh, is there a biomarker? I wish there was a biomarker. There isn't a biomarker. Um, you know, our next two speakers might better tell you what you can do next um, in patients who aren't doing well. And that's kind of what this session is all about. Uh, so, yeah, the best laid plans often do go astray. And what's the patient looking for? What does the patient want? That's your biggest question. Not like what's the next best drug, but what does the patient want? Um, so, in your opinion, this is the polling question, what's most common? Why do people fail? What is the problem? Is the problem misdiagnosis? Comorbidity? Is it adherence? Is it the wrong drug? Or is it fibromyalgia? Please answer now. Come on. You can do it. It's one of these. All right? All right. Let's go. Keep going. All right, there we go. Now you're waking up. Okay, let's see what the audience thinks as far as um, what's the most common reason that patient is so-called difficult or refractory. All right, we'll wait for 100. All right, good. So I have to press a button to see the results. Still voting? All right. Fibromyalgia leads the way. Then fibromyalgia is difficult to treat. Comorbidity is a significant um, player in this mix. Patient adherence, not surprising. Misdiagnosis, not me. I don't make that problem. You know, I mean, that's, that's those other rheumatologists on the other side of town. But again, it boils down to what does the patient need? And the patient needs a, well, go back. Patient needs a hero. And that's really what they want. They want someone who's gonna save the day. The question is, are you the hero? And if you're the hero, who's the villain? You know, is the villain the RA? Is it the mistakes that are being made in that patient's care? It's hard to know. But in the villain, as in movies, you know, it's always the unexpected. It's the change in course that you didn't anticipate. It is an unclear motive, or what's driving this is obviously eluding you, and that's why you're in this situation, and you're being held hostage. It's, a, it's what happens in clinic all the time. So when you're good at this, you're like Bruce Willis showing up in, at a Christmas party and figuring out the problem. And he doesn't really know when he shows up that he's going to have this problem. He doesn't know what he's going to do. But he's resourceful. He has skills. He has knowledge. And he has experience. And that's what comes to play. I mean, look at what's down here in the, in the movie liner. He's alone, tired. And the only chance for anyone is him, you know. And that's kind of how people are looking at you. So, you, you know, you look at these situations. You've got to judge the situation and figure out what's wrong. So the question is, what's wrong with this picture? 
And I think it boils down to wrong diagnosis, wrong drug, wrong patient, wrong doctor. And for each of these, there's actually an approach. I'm going to tell you three things that you can do with wrong diagnosis. There's things to consider under wrong drug. Same for wrong patient and same for wrong doctor. Let me show you what I, my approach to this. So wrong diagnosis. Again, this doesn't happen to any of us, but in fact it does. Um, Tuliki Soko used to work with Ted Pincus, went back to Finland, and this is one of her studies that she published on 435 consecutive early seronegative RA, SNRA, seronegative RA. And the 10-year follow-up of these patients is what? 3% were became erosive or became seropositive, clearly RA. 32% could not be reclassified, meaning that they stayed as seronegative RA. But 65% in 10 years changed their diagnosis. And, and here's the most common ones, PMR, PSA, Spondy, OA. One of our speakers in the, in the next step talk or TED talk is Ronan Cavanaugh. He, I think, famously said once that one of his coaches and mentors told him, every time you see a seronegative is your opportunity to ask the question, is this really RA? Because unless you ask that question repeatedly, you may very well miss the diagnosis. So there are misdiagnoses, and this is a hodgepodge of things in some of that which were on the prior list, but these are the things that should be kept in the back of your mind. We've all seen patients who are seronegative RAs, and oh, then they develop inflammatory bowel disease, right? I think that these are often unified by being more atypical in presentation, a longer time to make the diagnosis, unresponsive to DMARDs or biologics, or they have reactions to everything. Then the point is that I think you're dealing with something more than what you've been calling RA and maybe another diagnosis. Okay, what about wrong drug? This is really what most of us do. We think, well, I'm just going to keep switching drugs. Uh, at Artie's meeting uh, a few weeks ago in Maui, RWCS, I asked the faculty panel a difficult case. I gave him this case of one long-standing disease. She'd been on 15 DMARDs. She had like 900 comorbidities. It was a case from hell, and of course, nothing is working in her anymore. I was impressed. The point of my, my presentation then was, at some point, you throw in you know, the towel and say, no, enough, meaning another DMARD isn't going to fix this situation. But my faculty panel said, there's four more DMARDs we haven't yet tried. Isn't it worth doing that? And I don't know that that's the case. My point is that people that you call difficult RA is not always going to respond to another drug, another DMARD, another biologic. So we've got lots of choices. But think about it. You know, on, on this list, there's 22 FDA-approved um, biologics and conventional DMARDs. And if you've only done 15, do you have to go through the other seven? Or do you need to wait for the next four to come along to be the savior to your D2RA, D2TRA? No. I think you need to know when to use these, and obviously evidence of inflammation, either by lab, by exam. But the problem is at this stage of the game, their exam becomes somewhat unreliable. They have deformities. They got pooched out synovium. Is that swollen? I don't really know. They're obese. It's hard to tell. One of the things came out of ULAR was maybe the one tool you have in this situation is ultrasound. Maybe ultrasound in people, when you're trying to figure out whether it's inflammatory or not, use the ultrasound, and maybe that helps you in deciding what to do next. I like to take the, the approach of kitchen sink failures, you reboot the system. If you are a Mac person, sorry, you're not going to get this. But if you're a PC, it's Control-Alt-Delete, you reboot, and you take a new start. And by this approach, I mean delete the things from the menu that the patient says, I won't take. I don't care what the reason is. Blue toenail syndrome, you know, itchy eyeballs when I took gold. I don't really care. Just don't give them a drug that they won't take. Moreover, don't give them a drug that they previously failed. So you're taking off the things on the menu that are going to drive the patient crazy. Don't do that. You need to work with them. You're going to put on the menu the things that they are inclined to respond to. So this is what controlled them previously. And then you show your mastery by throwing in another drug, maybe, that they've never taken before, the alternatives, some of which are FDA approved, some of which may be off-label, but have been tried in other patients with RA. 
This is how I approach people that I call kitchen sink failures, where I don't really know what to do and I'm going to just try another biologic. This, I think, works better for me. This has worked better for me. But often, that's about you know, uh, your limitations on what you could. This is about being limited by a, um, a comorbidity. Patients come, and at this point in, in the story, you can't give them what you want to give them because they have these comorbidities. And for each of these, there's a correct choice and there's a wrong choice. And I can spend three hours going over what I think is the, the wrong choice and what I think is the right choice. In the case of diverticulitis, you don't want to use prednisone at JAK or an IL-6, right? That makes sense. Anybody who wants this slide, it's in your handout. I'm going to put it on Room Now on Monday. You can download it and use it and look at it and, and argue with me about it. But I think that this is one construct for dealing with um, that situation. The other situation is where can I find an advantage? There are two situations. One is seropositivity. We all have the data. There are drugs that we use that really aren't impacted at all by whether the patient's seropositive or not. TNF inhibitors, IL-6 inhibitors, um, usual DMARDs don't really aren't affected here. But there's good data to say that if you're seropositive, you may get as much as 10% more response by using rituximab or abatacin or maybe even a JAK inhibitor with recent data that's coming out. And it works best when this is your er, guides your early choices, you might get even more than 10%. When it's later choices, you might get up to 10%. But is that not better than what I'm going to do in my next choice where I'm going to flip a coin and it's 50-50? It's probably less than 50-50. Use this advantage. The other way to get an advantage is to use machine learning and big data. There's, you know, um, those of us who go to the meeting and watch what happens at ACR and ULAR, there's a growing number of abstracts on artificial intelligence and machine learning, and it's overwhelming and it often is very confusing and it often goes nowhere. So I'm going to give you a one nice study that looks at Cerilumab. And in this particular study, they looked at four of their trials that were used in the development of Cerilumab. They developed a, um, a rule. And the rule was developed based on all the variables, clinical variables they had. And they showed what would show us a difference between an IL-6 response and a TNF response. And the rule was being ACPA positive and being CRP positive. Now, this is an IL-6 inhibitor. The data that says that patients with high CRP are going to respond better to IL-6 is actually not there. It's, you know, sometimes maybe, but usually it doesn't pan out. But maybe if you combine it with ACPA, now it gets to be predictive. So in their target trial, they had over 300 patients. The number who responds with ACR20 response was 67%. If you now use the rule and look at CCP positivity, this 67 goes to 72. If you add in the CRP greater than 12.3 milligrams per liter, it now goes up 14 points to 81%. This is where big data will better characterize for you maybe what your next choice is. But it's going to take a lot of big data and a lot of different therapeutic areas that you can plug in your data and get an answer. But I think you're going to see this in the future. Wrong patient. Well, they're kind of easy to spot, are they not? Um, and um, I got into handwriting analysis and whatnot, and the guy that taught me handwriting analysis has this thing called hell traits, which I really like the sound of. It sounded like a number of my patients. So I made up my own uh, hell traits list that has nothing to do with handwriting analysis, but has to do with certain behaviors. So the non-compliant ones, you know, they won't go, they don't show, they can't do, they got, you know, they're just... Next, negativistic thinking. I call that diabolical negativism. I wrote, and people who think like this, you know who they are. I tell them, listen, the risk of getting PML with rituximab with RA is 1 in 30,000. They go, that's me, doc. I'm going to get it. And I tell them, you're not that special. You're just Mr. 1 in 30,000. No, you don't understand, doc. I get all the bad stuff. And people are getting mired by this, and I have a blog called Diabolical Negativism that, approach, that it sort of has an approach to that. Poor patient managers. I send them to my other blog on being CEO of your own health, because most people are not good managers of their own health, and they need to learn that. Poor sleepers, often depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, chronic pain sinkers, and, and then on the special group, the vaccinots, the magical thinkers, the different drummers, you know, join the club, pay the dues, but those people are not going to help you get over your problem. Identifying these people 
<laughs> you know, there are things to do with some of them, but they can be hard. I think it's better to recognize the fact that not all patients are going to be uh, well managed just based on their phenotype. Meaning, you can look at patients, you don't know that they're not going to respond or, they're go or, or that they will respond great. Often, some of the most active patients we have respond the best to the therapies we use. So phenotype doesn't help you very much. Um, I think we should be more in favor of self-management, self-efficacy schemes. You know, these are in some of the guidelines, that, um, but yet we don't really approach this. This is about empowering the patient. Uh, and why? Because, you know, the patients, when they assess themselves, that's often different than the way you assess them. They're driven by pain. You're driven by swelling. You know, what's important to them is not necessarily important to you. So, you know, encouraging them to get involved in a support group. Uh, you know, use a mobile app. Caleb has written about that. Um, you know, lifestyle issues, exercise, mental health, CBT, you know, identifying cycle. These are all gigantically important in patient outcome, and we pay really no attention to this. And this stuff becomes even more important in these difficult patients. What's your role? Your role is educating them and supporting them. You know, I say my goal in, in treating my patients is to give them hope, goals, and rules. That means I have an obligation to them in that visit to give them hope, goals, and rules, meaning I got to talk about stuff that guides them one step closer to proper use of their drug, but also maybe other, other things like lifestyle. So let's get into another case. 45-year-old um, female, um, seropositive, on methotrexate, prednisone, a JAK inhibitor, hydroxychloroquine, failed a lot of drugs, now has one hour of stiffness, has polyarthritis, polyarthralgia, that's her hands. She's failed methotrexate, plaquil, sulfazalazine, leflunamide, adalimumab, sirlizumab, abatacept, nonsteroidals, et cetera, past medical history of shingles, hypertension, obesity, sleep apnea, has mild inflammation. What are you going to do? So that's a polling question. What are you going to do? Okay, so what is your next best option? You can see them here on screen. You can either change to sub-Q methotrexate order a sleep restudy, change to another JAK inhibitor, use rituximab, or get another opinion, maybe another rheumatologist. Again, remember this patient has seropositive disease, has failed a lot of therapy, hydroxychloroquine, sulfazalazine, methotrexate, loflunamide, adalimumab, sertilizumab, abatacept, and nonsteroidals. All right, here come the answers. Look at this. Leading the way, you love to use rituximab. Well, in fact, most of you don't use rituximab um, in RA, but in this situation, when the patient's failed almost everything, it seems that you're going to lean on that compared to going to parenteral sub or subcutaneous methotrexate. Um, lowest on the list is change to a different JAK inhibitor and get a room second opinion. Well, this is actually all about getting a second opinion. And, you know, there are times when it's really a, a wrong doctor issue. And the question is, what are your options when you're wanting to get another doctor involved? Remember, you know, you can't be successful on everyone. You can't hit a home run on everyone. And there are this 10% of patients of difficult to treat RA patients where you're just not going to, in your first, second, third, fourth try, get it right. You know too well as a rheumatologist that delays in referral lead to poorer outcomes. If you delay the option of sending this to someone else and getting another opinion, then you're contributing to the problem. Rheumatologists should consider second opinions. Now we do this all the time if we have partners or if we work in a large group. I was talking just yesterday with Philip Malloy and we talked about what we do in our communities and whatnot. And He's talking about, you know, city rounds where rooms get together and present difficult cases. This is like the ideal best friendliest fellowship form of getting a second opinion. It works really well. It's timely if you have these conferences on a regular basis. This also works if you're in a medical school environment or an academic center where rheumatologists are getting together in clinical conferences where they can, in fact, refer patients to or talk about patients with each other instead of actually doing the big referral. There are several other options. Um, I think in the future, we're gonna be seeing more peer-to-peer, internet-based virtual consultations. 
Uh, it's going on now. It happens at the Cleveland Clinic. It happens at um, major centers, and it can be billed back to the patient. What we do see is that you can get this done and, and send it to another colleague. And getting, sending it to another colleague is actually really beneficial. Often what's going to happen is the um, diagnosis may not change, but the treatment options and other thoughts um, are going to be new to both the patient and you. So consider sending the patient to another physician. Listen to the patient. He's telling you the diagnosis, William Osler. That's really important in managing these people. You need to have that sort of approach. Uh, again, we do have this sort of uh, um, inequality between what patients think and what you think, and we really should get into more shared decision making, where you're asking the patient actively, what do you want? What are your goals? What's your understanding of what we're doing here? Um, so why chronic disease needs shared decision making more than anyone? Um, often they're being asked to make decisions, complex decisions about therapy. And, and, and you know, while 96% of people say that they want to know more, half of them are going to actually let you make the decision for them. But that does mean half of them want to have a vote. No, I don't want to take, you know, a cancer drug. So uh, patients are actively involved. There's complex options. Um, there's, they choose the care they prefer, they prefer. I think that why should you do this? Patients view themselves as being the expert of themselves. And this inequality, this knowledge asymmetry between the physician and the patient really begs for the patient to be involved more. And it is certainly more respectful. So what happens? Do patients do better with, with shared decision making? Not a lot of data on that, but they do better as far as compliance and adherence. They are more motivated by being more knowledgeable. There's a low, there are studies showing a lower cost of care, and there's higher patient satisfaction. And again, this can be a team approach. You need decision aids. Decision aids are things like this. You know, these are handouts that explain the key decisions that the patient needs to make. You don't want to send them for a course in epidemiology. You want to give them what information they can, in fact, understand. So lastly, I think physicians do make mistakes. My pet peeves are aiming for monotherapy. Uh, I think that's silly. I think actually uh, ratcheting down therapy and stopping therapy, I think that's even sillier, if not dumber. Again, this is a highly complex disease. You spent your whole life trying to manage. To think that you can reduce this to single drug therapy and or to withdrawing drug therapy is foolish. To play into that is to invite the devil into your household, meaning they're going to flare, they're going to do badly. Not maximizing drugs that you commonly use. Steroids, they, you know, in these difficult cases, they're needed, but is it worth it? Is, which is worse, the slow-dose steroid you're going to use or, uh, you know, not using the steroid? It's a bit of a problem. And then waiting to change, we are often difficult of making slow decisions. So what's wrong with this picture? Wrong diagnosis, wrong drug, wrong patient, wrong doctor. Thank you very much. All right, Jack, thanks very much for starting us off. Uh, a bunch of questions, and, and some have been upvoted. Uh, one that I, th I think got the most upvoting was, what about the use of ultrasound or MRI to determine whether ongoing issues are from inflammation or pain? Yeah, I, well, first off, I think when you're dealing with pain that, out, that is um, uh, a standout, more so than maybe signs of inflammation, you got to think of structural disease and, um, and damage. Uh, and maybe fracture, uh, and in those situations, imaging is going to help. Now, how far do you go? I think ULAR's guideline on using ultrasound to find inflammation, no inflammation, very smart. MR, you know, I, I was in a conference on Grand Rounds on Thursday where they were presenting a case, someone with ill-defined inflammatory tenosynovitis and maybe a swollen joint, and the MR was a little bit positive, and the question is, what did it do with this patient? And, and of course, the consensus was, we're good. we did this MRI, let's treat them and redo the MRI. To me, that's not something I typically have done, but in that, when, the, when you're dealing with an undo diagnosis of uncertainty, and some of these people you are dealing with uncertainty, MR could be appropriate. And there were a couple of comments in the chat as well about osteoarthritis, that that may be, the person may be refractory because their rheumatoid is controlled, but they have osteoarthritis either unrelated or because of the rheumatoid, and that is not controlled. Uh, some, there was a question about the use of a couple of lab tests, the 1433 ADA and also the PRISM test. Uh, how, what do you think about those? 
1433 ADA is more of a diagnostic test than a biomarker, although Walter Maximovich would say otherwise. Um, and it's, I, I don't think it's panned out to be as useful as ordering RF and CCP. I don't think it adds, it complements the story any further. So no, I, I've done a lot of them. I've not found them to be helpful in but a very few patients. Like I can count them on one, less than one hand. Um, and the PRISM test to tell me, do I need a test to tell me what not to do? I, I, I mean, no, I need a mother to tell me what not to do, um, and that's never been appreciated. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, Vectra, I don't think that PRISM, or I, I, I would never use them. I don't think, I don't think it's the, 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 it's modeled after what I like Artie's line is, uh, it's predicting, you know, the past, meaning they, they find, you know, data from the past and they, they, they farm out what could be useful in decision making and try to present that as a biomarker. That's not a biomarker. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who think they need the extra guidance of a lab test. Um, and if that means you're not a disciple of Ted Pincus, who has preached for 30 years, you don't need lab tests, you need a hack score. You need to listen to the patient. So there's a bunch of comments about the music being very loud. Is that an online thing, or is that, am I just not hearing the music? Do you, oh, oh, it's being okay. Okay, um, I, I just thought I wasn't getting the music. No, in my I, I requested a soundtrack to my presentation. <laughs> uh, last question: What about depression in autoimmune disease? As you mentioned, for your health trait patients. Well, I think that's really important, and and I, and I think it's. I'm kind of. I like forms, I like patients to fill out forms. How many of you actually do a depression question or index in your intake of patients? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's, you know, 10% of the, of the docs in the audience are doing that. That probably is a very smart move um, because depression often goes unnoticed. I don't know if you saw the recent Medscape article on depression and suicide uh, ideality in physicians. 10% of physicians are thinking, um, about suicide. And I'm not talking about those that are listening to my lecture. I'm talking about all specialties, including rheumatologists. And, and high on the list was pathology and emergency medicine. Lowest on the list was rheumatology at 5%, nephrology. At the point being that depression is a big issue that goes unrecognized. And I think to have a screening question that deals with that would help you greatly. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Jack. You.